Foot Clan, we got another great divisional episode for you today. We're talking some news. We're talking the NFC East. Jason's talking Antonio Gibson. You don't want to miss it. Welcome to the Fantasy Footballers Podcast with your hosts, Andy Holloway, Jason Moore, and Mike Wright. Oh, welcome in. Tuesday, July 12th. The Fantasy Footballers, Jason Moore, Mike Wright, Andy Holloway. Ooh. Back again. The boys are back in town. Yeah, all three of us are here sitting together at this table that we've sat at for many years. Ready to talk fantasy football. Ready to talk about the uh, that NFC East. It is an NFC East show today, so that'll be fun. Uh, some interesting uh, debates to be had, I think, in that division and fantasy relevance and upside and all of those things. Um, three shows a week now for the Fantasy Footballers podcast. You enjoyed a Saturday episode, saw some... Very happy folks. That Saw some manicured lawns. Nicely done. Oh, because they were listening. And then they needed something yeah. to do. Well, I, I'm told people have lawns and they mow them. I've heard that. Yeah, in <laughs> Arizona, we, we don't know about this. We either have we dead one. grass we or rocks. astroturf. Yeah, and, but I think our hearts, all they want green. They want growth. Yeah, oh, yes. They want life. Yeah. So when I drive by one of those zero scapes, lawns or, mm -hmm. or houses or whatever rock piles it just makes me sad because i want i want to i was just in california okay <clears throat> we were on vacation there's plants i've never seen before just beautiful big leaves and like you put that plant in arizona they just burn up that's right well that's yeah. why they put the the front yard of death out there what are you talking about the the this the, the xenoscaping or whatever it's called like everything oh, with it, like cactus everything and, in that yard wants to harm you because nothing else can survive out here. Yeah, let's move. That I've been trying to say this for years, guys. I I was making that same statement to my wife as I was driving through these beautiful hills and seeing all these plants, and then I suddenly didn't want to move there anymore. Oh, you looked up the prices. Got it. No, no, it was it was the traffic. The uh, traffic. Yes. Okay. Was an unimaginable. It was kind of like what a desert hellscape is for us out here, but on the roads, it was just awful. So we okay. never drove anywhere that once we got to our destination. Okay, but, fair enough. Um, yeah, three shows a week now, five a week starting in August through the end of the season. This is Ultimate Draft Kit time. Go to ultimatedraftkit.com. All of our rankings, projections, the draft analyzer is live now. Uh, we just redid a video for DJ Moore. After the Baker Mayfield trade, so which finally happened, of course, the second I think it happened while I was driving out of town. Mm -hmm. Not that I care about Baker that much. You should. I'm just indifferent to Baker. Is that okay? Can I just be completely neutral? Well, what about the he's indifferent Baker? to wins, losses. He's 500 for his whole career. That's exactly how I feel about him. Neutral. Yeah. He, Are I, you a fan of Baker? I am a fan of Baker, yes. Really? I, I am. I don't think He's he, even Stevens, yeah, from the old Seinfeld. He's even Stevens. Yeah, I don't think that Baker is a, a top 10 quarterback, but there's this kind of thing in the NFL where if you're not a top 15 quarterback, then you are a bum. And that's just not true. Baker is a serviceable man. like A serviceable man? <laughs> <laughs> what does he, that mean? He is, uh, he is a serviceable Mid-level quarterback. quarterback that can... I mean, look, he took a 1-31 and 31 team to the playoffs and got a playoff win and played through injury. Wait, Nick Chubb did? <laughs> Nick Chubb was there as well, but I, I really do think that he is he's an fine. average... Yeah, he's an he's average... Totally, he's fine. I agree with you. He's, we're saying the same thing. He's fine. But I like Baker the person. And Baker... And, and if you had to bet your house on whether Baker was a starting quarterback in two years... I don't think you'd do it. I would absolutely bet that he is a starting quarterback in two years. You would make that bet? I would. 
I think Baker Mayfield is a starting quarterback I in mean, two years. I mean, look, this is the same pattern we've seen over and over again. Ironically, on the Panthers, who are really good at this, let's bring in a once was on another team, a first-round draft pick, Teddy Bridgewater. Oh, he still isn't. Let's bring a once has been Sam Darnold to the Carolina Panthers. Oh, no, he still isn't. Baker will be as, as uh, he isn't as well. You know what they say about that third time, though. It's the charm. Why are you counting when they brought back Cam Newton? I love that you're a now a Baker <laughs> stan. That is awesome. <laughs> yeah. Which may how much of this is because his last name is Baker? I mean, I'm well, a big fan of the Well, it's actually not his last name, but what did I say? His unless last name? It, unless he <laughs> did he formally change to Baker <laughs> Baker? <laughs> Baker Baker. Um Mike, are you neutral? Wait, have we ever talked about that? Baker Baker? His name is Baker? <laughs> yeah. I've Wait, never thought well, you were just you're first, just as a topic? Just as who have you ever met someone named a job before? I have never I'm met sure. someone named, you know, Shoemaker <laughs> that's not their last name. Like a Baker like, is his name? Like uh, roof, and, Roofer? <laughs> <laughs> roofer. That's the, that's the best comparison. Roofer Johnson, one of my best friends growing up. <laughs> Uh, I mean, I've, I'm excited that Baker is better than Darnold. He is better than the version that they had of Cam Newton. He is better than the version of Teddy Bridgewater that they had. And look, man, it's I we've we we have said on the show when you get these level of quarterbacks changing teams, it's it's not the answer. It's not the fantasy football answer. But at least we can have some hope because if it was Sam Darnold again. You would you would abandon all hope and, and just DJ Moore get you eleven hundred yards and four. Now there's a chance that he puts up eleven yeah, hundred and maybe six plus. Okay, okay, I I get what you're saying. You're trying to take the hopeful view, but let me ask you, Mike, do you want the pit in the jungle with the spikes at the bottom of it? Do you want it wide open up top where you know you can avoid it? Or do you want it with the the palm fronds laid over the top of it? Because that's what all of these off season middle-level quarterback signings are to me. They're just a few palm fronds over the top, and guess what? You end up in the pit at the end of the season. Well, either way, I'm going in the pit. I would uh, just Yeah, but you'd rather know. Uh, you'd rather prepare for the fall. Would you? Oh, absolutely. I don't want to accidentally fall eight feet down into a pit. I want to. How do you properly prepare to fall into a pit of spikes? You, well, I didn't know there Wasn't were spikes. Wasn't this your thing? I, I he just said. I, 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 I missed the spikes part. Isn't this your things to remember? Yes. About middling yes. quarterback I changing have. teams. And suddenly a man with a job as a name changes teams to a team that has proven that he – Matt Rule cannot coach this team. He will not be the quarter. He will not be the coach, and Baker won't be the quarterback next year. Put it on the board. I, Both gone. I would agree with that. When I said Baker will be a starting quarterback in two years, I did not think it would be for the Panthers. What, so he'll be that good – having changed teams that he's going to a third starting. He'll be the next Carson Wentz. Uh, the bridge gap quarterbacks always find work. They All do. right. We don't need to talk about it. This was me finally getting to talk about Baker. I hadn't had that opportunity yet. But we can uh, we can move on. We got the NFC East, and we got a little bit of news. News and notes from around the league. Not a lot of news. Just a couple little things to talk about. One, for Dynasty League specifically, for your tight end landscape, Dolphins have not even opened talks with Mike Kosicki on a long-term deal, so it seems likely he will find another home next year. There is a little optimism that Dalton Schultz will sign a long-term deal. There is a little time for that. We have about three days left, and if it doesn't get done in that time period, then he will play on the franchise tag. This is a huge, huge issue for dynasty leagues because I think Dalton Schultz if he were to sign a long-term extension in the next three days becomes one of the best like you you should just go and see if you can acquire him the second the contract is signed because he's got such a good role here but otherwise I view him as someone that's going to leave in free agency get a contract somewhere and be irrelevant and then there was further I mean take it for whatever you want Mike Silver um, NFL reporter was talking with Colin Coward about a report on Trey Lance, arm fatigue last year, basically saying they had the Trey Lance package at the beginning of the year. They weren't thrilled about it. They moved away from it. Everything in the schedule, like I, mean, I know last season we were in the middle of it and we said, hey, if this team is under 500 at a certain point in the year, they're going to just see what they have in the number, was it th two pick in the draft? Um, that never happened. They said that 
they are rebuilding his throwing motion. So what did you make of that news that his he was getting arm fatigue and so they had to rebuild his throwing motion and yeah. that they were worried about accuracy? Did this report mean anything to you? Whenever you have number a three pick, sorry. Yeah, whenever you have a report like this, you you know, especially considering where it came from, it was like you question is that true? Is that not true? I know Ted Wynn, uh, the athletic uh, reporter, said he asked a member of the 49ers coaching staff about the arm fatigue, and his response was, quote, I've never heard anything about that a day in my life. Now, you would expect the 49ers coaching staff to not throw their starting quarterback under the bus, but I'm not I'm, – I guess I'm not just convinced that this is true. So I have done nothing with this news. <laughs> and, like, the him not taking over, which they're – quoting you know in this piece like he started a game against Arizona you know they lost 10 to 17 it's like his his first full you know full game as a starter and he hurt his knee like he missed multiple weeks because of an injury and at that point you don't feel like you have to go back to the rookie that kind of got things going with there with Jimmy Garoppolo and it made sense to stick with him so they I don't know I this, this piece is kind of all over the place the only reason I bring it up is because when you have like every three weeks kind of weird stories about like, would you say that the pathway for Trey Lance thus far has been traditional ordinary? No, like there have been a lot of weird warning signs and question marks. And, yeah, the, the prospect being drafted at number three was weird to start. So like from the very, very beginning, sure, sure. everything has been strange about Trey Lance. What was it? It was, um, he started like one year, like Malik Willis this past off season in the draft, like at, by the time the draft came along, right. things had changed to where you know, he wasn't being projected as a super high pick, but there were mock drafts on Malik Willis being the number one, two, three pick in the draft early in the offseason. So I guess that, that shows how big of a difference you can have in opinion. Sure, and, and, and again, this analysis being discussed you know, on a show where if a quarterback wears their hat backwards, they're not a good quarterback. So th that's where this information was coming from. Sure, sure. I, I wasn't sure if uh, you guys thought anything of it. But, you know, Trey Lance is one of the biggest risk-reward gambles in fantasy football yes. for 2022 because we know how valuable it can be for him to be on the field. And if he shows any of the promise that, that you know, you saw briefly in college or that someone like Kyle Shanahan would invest in, then the reward for fantasy players is massive, right? I mean, absolutely. And the cost, you know, you you start to get to this place with Trey Lance where would you? I mean, should everybody draft Trey Lance? He, should he's... every single person in a draft <laughs> when it gets to the that point, whether you have a court, another quarterback or not, should a hundred percent of people draft Trey Lance for the chance that he's well, a top I'll, ten quarterback? I would say one in twelve should draft Trey Lance in most mm. leagues, but I. I do think um, that he is a great draft pick for where he's going. Yeah, I mean, uh, in, in underdog leagues right now, I've seen him going around pick 80. And if certainly if I don't have a quarterback yet, he's not going past me there. And oftentimes when I have one, I'm grabbing him as a second. He's been he's been moving up on underdog. But like right now on, you know, the, the sleeper ADP, he's going in the 10th round. And your wide receivers and your running backs that you're taking in the in the 10th round, your probability is very small. The probability for Trey Lance being that top five guy, not tremendous, but still way higher that that happens than you find a wide receiver there who all of a sudden makes it into your starting roster. So I I do. I think I, I agree that drafting Trey Lance as a second quarterback in the double-digit rounds I think is a, is a good shot to take. Well, I, I guess my point being that there could be more of a trap if you draft him there and you put all your hope in it. But you know what I mean? Because then you are you're you're waiver wiring your quarterback at that point, right? If that's who you're and you're locking him into your lineup, which might be not the commitment you want to make to a 10th, 11th round pick. Whereas if you did have if you kind of like you said worked independently of whether you have another quarterback. You know, you go into the season with Kirk Cousins and Trey Lance? Sure. I would much rather do it with a with a later quarterback. Yeah, I think we all would. I don't want to I like I don't want to draft, you know, Herbert real early and then take Trey Lance and play that game of, oh, if Trey Lance hits, then, you know, I'm going to trade one of these quarterbacks. But here's <laughs> because in a lot it, in a lot of single quarterback leagues, trading a starting quarterback, all, it, it sounds like a great idea. And then when you actually go to try and trade them, 
Nobody wants to pay anything of value for that quarterback. Um, this would be my concern here, Kyle. What were you just sharing on ADP with Trey Lance? He just passed Tom Brady on underdog. Yeah, yeah I mean, taking I'm taking that shot. That's that's a little different with the best ball format, taking your shot at league winner. Um, coming for Russell Wilson next. Mm. I mean, in a redraft, obviously, I want Brady or Russell Wilson. <clears throat> Over Trey Lance. Yeah, but you may not by the end of the season. I can't wait, Mike. <laughs> I can't wait to I talk just, about Trey Lance. Somewhere. I want to see the dude play. Like, after having to go through with everything for last year, and we're still in the can he play phase of sure. his career, like, it's obnoxious. Get the it dude, is obnoxious. Get the dude on the field. And let's right. find out. You're right. All right, let's move on. Let's get divisional. Not covering the NFC West, so no more Trey Lance discussion. Uh, we're in the NFC East today, our divisional breakdown show, looking at offseason changes from 2021 to 2022, and uh, looking at the offenses, how they might function in the coming year. And we're into the NFC West, or NFC East. We're talking about the Dallas Cowboys, 12-5 and five last year. <laughs> One of the most incredible things about Dallas is that despite being the number one point scoring team in all of football, which they were and number one in pace of play, which you say to yourself, I want a piece of that. I want two, three pieces of that. Mm -hmm. Despite that fact that they average more than 30 points a game. This is incredible. All of Dallas Cowboys, uh, all the starters in fantasy drafts failed to return on their draft costs last year. Mm. So Dak was drafted at QB six finished QB seven Zeke RB four finished RB six. Those are very minor differences. I'd be. Yeah. Those, are, okay. those are fine. Payouts. Okay. With those, but CD lamb, seven spots lower Amari Cooper, um, from 12. 15 to 20. Yeah. 12 spots lower. Michael Gallup with the injury, Blake Jarwin didn't work out. And Tony Pollard, you know, like he was, we'll talk about Tony Pollard shortly. Cause it, it's an interesting, uh, discussion, but one of the reasons for this, and I think uh, a good discussion point for talking about the Cowboys this year, is the total points scored as far as leading. A lot of those points were defensive points. They were, I mean, they they had so many defensive touchdowns it was ridiculous. And those things crush an offense in a way because when you get that pick six and now you're up and uh, you know it's it, yeah, now you're worst. protecting your score. It's like man, you you're. It's great if you're playing the Cowboys defense, but if you've got Dak Prescott and CeeDee Lamb, now it's like, well, Nick, why aren't you going to throw the ball? Yeah. It could have been better, for sure, but they were still number one in total yards, two in passing yards. And we come into this season, I think, with misplaced uh, ambiguity about the the receivers in the passing game because of the Amari, Amari Cooper departure. And Michael Gallup. It's the it's the twofer to me because I, I know I have a lot of fear over this wide receiving core, um, and it's because you lose Amari Cooper and Michael Gallup probably isn't ready to go right off the bat. So now you're looking at a depth chart where this is why we love CeeDee Lamb because he is going to be the dude just about no matter what. He, he doesn't have a choice. Outside of him, you're talking about uh, James Washington and um, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah I mean, you're laughing at James Washington and Jalen Tolbert, who was you know uh, uh, is is an incoming rookie. Yeah, and I think it, it's going to work itself out just fine. I mean, Dak is going to be healthier than he's ever been. They were they throw the ball a ton. They're going to have to, and uh, like you said, CD's a lock, but I think Dak is going to be fine. I have no problem with the ADP for Dak. I think that Zeke is the biggest question mark for this team where, you know, perennial top five pick for fantasy football. He still came through for people last year. It was, you know, a, a little bit bumpy along the way, which is not what you expect. He, Zeke is usually very consistent, but still finishing at the RB6, 1,000 rushing yards, 10 touchdowns, 47 receptions. And we learned after the season, in week four, he partially tore his PCL, and they just he played through it. And you can see, like through those weeks, you know, week one catastrophic against the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, but then RB eight one six, like he was off to a real 
hot start there, hurts the knee, things kind of slow down, and then you get into the question of, well, we need Tony Pollard on the field more. And even with all the people saying that, he's still getting basically, you know, 18 opportunities a game. And now he has dropped into the back of the third round, like running back 15. I I think that's ridiculous. Like I would be very happy to to draft Zeke as a top 12 running back still. I, I think he can get it done at least for one more year. And we hold off the, the Tony Pollard – uh, Twitter hive yet for one more season. I I think that he's just a sensational pick there. Yeah, I think we end up with him in so many drafts right now, and I don't know. I don't know if with training camp and him getting buzz and and the health that we'll see that ADP rise or not. But I don't he, think you he, will. He just dominated so many negative narratives over the back half of the year. I mean, he to be honest rushing the football at times he looked like end of career David Johnson in Arizona yes. and I think because you have the age factors the yards per carry decreasing over time it was easy to take all of those negative emotions associated with those performances not look at the big picture not look at the volume and just try to you know write the eulogy yeah I think the reality is he is getting Worse, not better, because sure. every single NFL player at some point does. And so drafters in those first two rounds, they're wanting the next great thing. You know, they're they're wanting the the breakout, the the number one running back. And you just don't look at Ezekiel Elliott as an upward arrow. So nobody's climbing over themselves or drafting him ahead of ADP. They're just letting him fall to wherever he is in their systems. But the reality is he's very, very safe. He has yet to have a single year in his career where he's not a top 12 running back he's his volume is there and it doesn't even matter the eyeball test between him and Tony Pollard if Tony Pollard is faster and maybe better in his limited work it's irrelevant this is Zeke's job he's going to be the guy and I think he's going to be a fantastic value pick I still don't think he has I don't think he's going to be a top five running back I mean obviously he's only one spot away last year so he could but not in a way that's like him getting there but some you know as, as much as like him just uh well, stat accumulating well, the, his one, way one there. thing i'll throw in of like this is in the range of outcomes like we talk about vacated targets frequently going to the running back position he had 47 this past year but in 2018 he had 77 receptions like there's a chance that he gets back into like the low 60s with you know the departure of Amari Cooper and all the injuries and everything. Don't forget best friend. Well, and Tony, <laughs> Tony sure. Pollard. Best deck. Tony Pollard only averaged 1.1 third down opportunity per game. So the, there is a the myth that Pollard's going to be in there all the time doing that. What Pollard took more of was the carries. I mean, from week 6 on, Zeke was a 215 attempt pace over 17 weeks. That's not a lot of Carries well, yeah, that's not for what you're Zeke. used to for Zeke, yes. Two, and, and for 700 yards. Like, if you get 215 for 700, you've got a major problem with Zeke. So just coloring in the other side of it, it's ironic that he finished, where did you say on the season? Running six. back six. He finished at six. He had one single finish the entire year inside the top five. Yeah. I mean, he, so that was the other part of it, too, is you felt accumulation. You felt stability in some sense, but you didn't feel any sort of former Zeke or you know, or any sort of weak winning. I'm gonna save the day. I mean, he was exactly totally. It comes down to: Do you believe that the the knee injury was was the primary cause for the decline, or was that simply just a piece of the puzzle for Zeke? Because if it if everything that's your, was that's the why injury, he's in the third round. If everything don't is, know. is the injury, then he's going to smash in the run for being drafted in the third. Yeah, I don't. I don't think it was the injury, but I still think he's going to be a. A value there I you know smash is a little aggressive for me but I do think where he's being drafted is below where he'll finish but Dalton Schultz should be an integral part of the offense this season yeah whether playing on the franchise tag or not Michael Gallup injured his ACL in week 17 so he's not going to be a player you draft in fantasy drafts I I, I imagine <sighs> unless you wanted to throw him on a if you have an IR spot an IR spot late in, like last pick throw him on the IR spot and sign somebody uh, he just in an ACL tear that late, man, I'm, I'm out. He had surgery February 10th after the week 17 ACL. So likely start on the pup, 
um, and he'll produce better in November when guys come back immediately from the ACL. Um, usually it's in in, an entire, the first year back from an ACL, they're not as good statistically. They don't return to their previous state until the year two from the ACL. Didn't, uh, Cooper cup have a pretty solid. Yes, he did. Post ACL season. Like I, I do and think then a really solid one last year. I don't know if you know, I just think Gallup will be very integral to the team. He has to be. I mean, so, when I mean, he comes back, when he comes back, th this is what I'm talking about. The, the The wide receiver depth chart here scares me. And I love the fact that Dak is able to run. They're talking about his health. They're talking about having him run because he was low for me in my rankings. He wasn't even a top 12 quarterback until the that news. I think he's going to have to be more mobile this year. Uh, get some rushing touchdowns because there's, you know, there's Dalton Schultz and, and CeeDee Lamb in the passing game. Even with Amari Cooper, Michael Gallup before the injury week was on a 125 target pace last season. He was having weeks of nine, nine, eight, ten targets. So he will be very important. And they chose him. They basically yeah. said, hey, despite the ACL, we want you. We don't want Amari. Uh, we're going to go with CeeDee and, and Gallup. So, um, you know, and they, yeah, they lost Cedric Wilson as well. So they, de they definitely – a lot of turnover in that room. Jalen Tolbert, any interest in him in fantasy drafts as of right now before camp, before it's, hearing anything? Yeah, I I, th I think it's interesting. The draft capital is, is high enough that he should be a day-one starter and a day-one starter for a team that if they continue to be the number one in pace of play and the number two in passing yardage, then – Absolutely. Now, the the last player really of note here, we've we've said his name a few times, but we haven't talked about drafting him, his upside or his downside, is Tony Pollard. Sure. He's going in the eighth round. That is not an irrelevant pick. That is a pick that, you know, I, I know you guys are, are very into A.J. Dillon, right? A player that yeah. you think you can play even though he's the running back too. An injury ahead of him makes him a top five guy, and I do think – that if Zeke were to go down, Tony Pollard would be a monstrous fantasy option here. But what are you doing in your in your drafts? Have you found yourself liking Tony Pollard or not liking him just because you like Zeke? I I find for me that because I'm I'm making the choice to be back in on Zeke that I'm out for Pollard. It, like I get all the arguments for him. I just I believe that Jerry Jones and this team with the contract will they'll stick with Zeke. What do you think they're projected? Win total is. Do you already know this? I do not. Vegas win total. Uh, let's go ten and a half. That was exactly what my number was going to be. It's ten. Is that right? Oh. Uh, is that ten? Um, we busted. Okay. All right. Uh, we will be taking a quick break, and then we're back with the Eagles. All right, let's talk about the Philadelphia Eagles, 9-8 and eight last season. Began last season with a projected win total of 6.5, so they outperformed that. 2-4 and four in one-score games. This was the biggest red flag of anything I saw in the reflection on their season. 1-8 and eight against teams above 500, right? They had a division with, with you know, a struggling Giants team and, and – Struggling Washington team. Washington. But one and eight against teams above five hundred. Uh, where do you think the projected win total is now? Well, I'm looking right at it, so oh. I can't play the game. <laughs> uh, I I would say nine, nine uh, and a half. Okay, started at eight and a half, but AJ Brown moved the needle for them. So this team is very very interesting to kind of try to break down what their offensive philosophy is really going to be about. So, last year, ninth in pace of play, 12th in points per game, 32nd in pass attempts, 25th in passing yards, 25th in passing touchdowns. So, right off the bat, when you, when you hear those numbers, it throws a little bit of concern into the mix for your receiving core that just added more complexity, right? I mean, A.J. Brown is a premier talent. Yeah. And Mike, you mentioned him as a bust candidate recently. Yeah, the AJ, <laughs> AJ Brown. This is like the worst type of fantasy player when you have a podcast and you have to give advice. Because my process here says that AJ Brown, who's being drafted as a top ten wide receiver, I like I I don't have him ranked anywhere near that. 
We've seen since 2018, 90% of top 12 wide receivers, they come from a, a system where the quarterback averages 235 passing yards per game, and you just mentioned it. They were 25th in passing yards, dead last in passing attempts. That will improve. Like A.J. Brown will be part of, of the process that makes those numbers go up. But do they go up to a point where early in the third round and you've taken A.J. Brown, will he give you enough of his, of the boom weeks? Because A.J. Brown, I'd, even if he finishes in the top 10, do you get enough of the spike weeks? Like, it was it you just you happened to get two of them throughout the season where he went just crazy and gives you like 150 and two and then is just just destroying your team or do you get you know five spike weeks you know scattered throughout the through the season I just I, and I have my concerns he's like Devonte Smith like completely buried his rookie season is, is buried because he's being compared to Jamar Chase and Jalen Waddle like so it it makes it look like what Devonte Smith last year did was not impressive at all except it was like he had a 22.4% target share. That's tied for the 12th highest of, of rookies since 2014. Like he was very imp important to this. And does AJ Brown come in and just bully him completely out of that? To, like, do we see Devonte Smith drop down to 18% of the targets? Well, I, I, I think it's important to know or note that Devonte Smith is a good wide receiver. Yes. That was his rookie year. He was great for a rookie. He's going to be better this season. He projects certainly to be the number two on this offense. Um, now, that's not to guarantee that he couldn't be the number one, but you would expect the money, the capital that they, they gave up to get the veteran A.J. Brown. He'll be the one. The real question here with this team, and I, you can have really logical, strong arguments for both sides, but the real question is, is this a run first team sure. or is this a pass first team? Because this was a new coaching regime that came in last year, and you started this year passing the ball 27 attempts 25 attempts 32 attempts through the first four weeks Jalen Hurts was on pace for 616 passing attempts that is a really good number the but the problem was they were one and three they were losing and so they switched and they said well we're we're able to run the ball really well we've got a nice offensive line we've got a mobile quarterback they ran the ball they won games and through the rest of the season, after those first four weeks, he was on pace for 443. So from 616 passing attempts to 443, it's two different teams here. Now, my belief, because you can uh, – you, you, you look, they made an offensive coordinator switch or the play caller switch, and that play caller is still being the play caller, so maybe it's run uh, going forward. But I think that what you saw to start the season was that this was a team that wanted to be modern, wanted to throw the ball – and they couldn't because they didn't have the weapons. Their their strength was in the running game. Now you look at what they did financially. They go out and they get A.J. Brown, and you've got year two Devonta Smith. So I think they're going to come out and throw the ball a little bit more. And during that time, Jalen Hurts, you know, through the first month, was the quarterback three. Um, and so it's a small sample and a lot of question marks here. Yeah, I would. I have I have the most confidence sitting in what they did and had success with, which was Sirianni passing off the play calling to Steich, Steichen. And is it Steichen or Steichen? Steichen. Okay, Steichen. so I got it right. I could have just kept going. Yeah. Um, and no, I mean, you, you know if you dumb. get it wrong, we will jump on you. Yeah, I know. I know. Like rear naked choke mid-show, <laughs> and, and so should have just uh, kept going. And, and, and if you remember, Steichen was, uh, I believe, with the Chargers calling plays for them with Justin Herbert's rookie season. So – he had more experience than Sirianni did. They said this offseason they're going to stick with him, but you don't bring in a weapon like A.J. Brown for no reason. So he'll be a focal point of the offense. I don't know if that just means the targets go to A.J. Brown as more of a focus because they had so much so much success running the football, and it became a joke in Philadelphia. I mean, the, the crowd was booing on a regular basis when they wouldn't hand the ball up, and they kind of – comically cheer every time Miles Sanders finally got a carry at the beginning part of the year because they struggled so much with that. So um, it will be hard for me. Like, I'm with Mike. I think it's just going to be a challenge. A.J. Brown will need to score a lot for him to be able to defeat those statistics about lower passing uh, yards per game numbers. 
but Jalen Hurts will be fine as a fantasy quarterback, and he will have more upside to actually have boom weeks, not just be a stabilizing quarterback because of the presence of A.J. Brown, because of Devontae Smith having another season in the offense, and hopefully because Miles Sanders is featured on a regular basis in a way that you know opens the offense up and gives them the potential to hit this or surpass this Vegas win total number. Yeah, I, I think this. I think the Eagles project to be a good team. I, I really do. Their defense is improved from this last great offseason. offensive line. Their offensive line is great. I think Jalen Hurts can get the job done with these weapons and his legs. I I think this projects to be a good team. And if you're a good team, Miles Sanders getting the ball running as well as he was. He was over five yards of carry last year. Some freaky weird stuff where he didn't get touchdowns. He should be a fine pick. That being said, I don't Touch, think... Touchdown, Jason. Yes, sorry. Um, I don't think that this team is going to use him as any kind of bell cow, though. They they just they don't really have a reason to say you are the guy and all these other running backs in their running back room are going away. That's probably not what the Eagles are going to do. So for fantasy, I find myself less bullish on Miles Sanders than you guys, even though the talent is there and the offensive line is there. Yeah, I, I, I liked don't... the carries at the end of the year. I don't care that he's not a bell cow because he's being drafted in the sixth round. He's not even being drafted as a top twenty-four wide receiver. There's or or running back, or, yeah, running back. <laughs> uh, but like, I mean, how many bell cow running backs exist in the NFL? They're all going in the first round of your fantasy football draft. So once you get to the sixth, you you want someone who's on a team that has a strong running game and going to score a bunch of points. And the Eagles fit that. And and, and then on top of that, Miles Sanders. Miles Sanders has juice, man. Like you said, over five yards per carry. Like in in his career, Miles Sanders is averaging just under five yards a carry. Like two seasons in a row, over five yards an attempt. Like boring. <laughs> I mean, boring. He's not in the boring. sixth round. I'm taking the running back with five point seven yards per attempt. Oh, and that's Jalen Hurts, baby. <laughs> that's my sixth round <laughs> Eagle running back. That's fine. He'll be on my team. Trying to diagnose anything inside the 10-yard line for the Eagles in a predictable way, I think is just foolish. Boston Scott led the team in carries inside the five. Jalen Hurts will run in a bunch. Miles Sanders can't score. Kenneth Gainwell's in year two. I think you just try to stay with what's most predictable. I will say that the average draft position gap between A.J. Brown and Devontae Smith is just ridiculous. Yep. And a product of, I think, all of the attention that that move made during the draft they are you know 24 spots apart Devonta Smith can drop into the eighth round and he's a really good wide receiver going into year two uh, if I'm in a redraft league I would prefer Devonta Smith over AJ Brown in a, in a best ball I do think AJ Brown will have massive blow up weeks so he's fine where he's being drafted so yeah Devonta could be a steal Dallas Goddard <sighs> what, do you, um, what do you do with him I, I don't know man he's good Number one in yards per target, number one in yards per route run, and yet that didn't really turn into a ton of fantasy goodness over the the final stretch of the year. He was giving you, you know, tight end two, tight end four, some good stuff, but it was not consistent despite the fact that w the fantasy world got what we desired, which was get Zach Ertz off this team, clear the space, let Dallas Gardner be the dude. That happened. And then Dallas Goddard re rewarded the people who drafted him with with nothing. You you probably moved on from him by the time he actually was producing at the end of the year. And now you have A.J. Brown in here to be the number one receiver for this team. I, the question I don't is, think there's enough to go around for Goddard. Are you going to spend a seventh-round draft pick no. on Goddard, or are you going to wait for somebody else later, nope. like Cole Komet? I'm or, waiting for Komet. I'm or waiting. Ertz. <laughs> I'll wait for Ertz. Ertz, Komet, Irv, <laughs> anyway. I abstain from answering that question. Oh, Dallas Goddard or I mean, Zach Ertz, Where's Zach Ertz right now, Kyle? He's tied in 10. Oh. Look, look men have what, to have. 10th round probably too then or something around there. Everyone yeah. has to be able to hold on to like. You got to bottle up a couple. Some secrets, uh, some, some dark, dark secrets in their life, and I will not answer the Zach Ertz question. Uh, I will say the schedule for Philadelphia is something to keep in mind if you're trying to decide between a couple of players in your draft, Detroit, Minnesota, Washington, Jacksonville, the first four weeks. Okay. I imagine they'll be favored in all four of those games, potentially. They're at home against Minnesota. 
So I think they might they should be. They might be the favorite in all four of their first games. All right, moving on to the Washington Commanders. Commanders. Seven and ten last year. The Manders. <laughs> new name, new game, and that game is Carson Wentz. Mm. Do you want to play that game? <laughs> I mean, no. Now I assume you make you would make all the identical Baker arguments for Carson Wentz in this situation. They are shockingly not that different. <laughs> um I you know it, the reality is um they're they're mirror situations. You have a guy who was once thought to be the next great franchise quarterback, a young prodigy for their team, took them to a place that hadn't been in a while and then has fallen from grace and uh, seemingly nobody wants him. But he is a perfect example of why I think two years from now Baker will still have a job because somehow Carson Wentz still has a job. And the way that he has the job is that he's replacing guys like Taylor Heineke, Dwayne Haskins, Alex Smith, Case Keenum, Kyle Allen, Colt McCoy, and Garrett Gilbert. He is better. He's just flat better than, than what the Manders have had the last couple years. Yeah, you're not lying, and he's not really an option that you're going to want to look at individually as a fantasy player. Um, he had two top 10 weekly finishes last year in Indianapolis where he managed to throw for 3,500 yards, 27 touchdowns, just seven interceptions, and still be so unlikable that they just wanted to boot him out, <laughs> not part of the future. I mean, that's, that's not a bad stat line. No. Mm. Statistically speaking, Carson Wentz is not bad com comparatively to like the rest of the league. But he is a player you have to – this is all decision-making stuff that we cannot quantify in our box score. Doesn't Carson Wentz and then the mustard color of this Washington Manders offense sure. – or logo – Aren't those a good fit? Oh, they're Isn't a great he the fit. mustardiest quarterback that <laughs> he's has very, ever? He's very sour. Oh, um, I mean, but the, the only is problem, he a Dijon. I, I mean, the only problem that no, I, he which is do, the bad one. He's he's well. I mean, the problem here is that mustard is great. Yeah, I like all mustard, so, but but if you're gonna classify him as a, he's just he's yellow, yellow mustard, just plain old yellow mustard. He's a which, coward. Well, look, Heinz. <laughs> he is yellow. <laughs> <laughs> we we went from a hot dog analogy to now you would you got to jump to chicken. You said he was yellow. I was going to jump into like Heinz has they need to sponsor a field now cuz they don't have one. What, what yeah, what happened? They couldn't negotiate it. I There was what? a lot of optimism that Pittsburgh would keep Heinz Field, but then suddenly, you know, what was it? Ac Acresher? I don't even know. Yeah, I don't know how to Samsonite. say it. Samsonite. Uh, <laughs> no, Akersher comes in and takes the Pittsburgh Stadium. I mean, the Manders with that mustard yellow. I'm just saying. Yeah, it goes, goes nicely. But uh, projected win total is eight for Washington. Now, they have a – Okay. They they have uh, Warren, Sh Warren Sharp, if you're unfamiliar, great, uh, great dude in the industry. He has the biggest scheduled jump in – um, their strength of schedule going from 32nd to the sixth easiest this season. So yeah, it was brutal last year. Their defense wasn't the same, and their offense was bad. Yeah, so things looking uh, potentially up for the Manders. Their defense is very curious because two years ago, their defense was locked down. Oh, amazing! They fooled me. And then last year they were awful with primarily the same personnel. I mean, uh, they lost Chase Young somewhere through the yes. year, but yes. they were bad before that. They Correct. were bad with Chase Young. So I don't know what to make. Like, I guess I just have that recency bias where I think the Manders defense is awful, but maybe it shouldn't be. <laughs> I don't know. It reminds me, it reminds me of when the Jaguars had that great defense and then they were bad and then they never recovered. They just right. stayed bad. And they went from second in defensive passing yards, given up to 29th. What happened? Fourth in points against the 25th. And you have pretty potent offenses in Dallas and Philadelphia in this division. I wouldn't be betting on them. Uh, they did add Jahan Dotson in the first round, wide receiver, 16th pick overall, Brian Robinson Jr. in the third round. And uh, they added Carson Wentz. Ryan Fitzpatrick is gone. We never really got to have yeah. Ryan Fitzpatrick in Washington. And so... You know, you look at this offense and you try to break it down and you try to find some optimism. Terry McLaurin got paid, 
But the Terry McLaurin story is the DJ Moore story. Yes, it is. So you want to compare like the Carolina quarterbacks and Washington situation is DJ Moore and McLaurin two superstars, really talent wise, that can put up a thousand yards, but probably don't score more than four or five times. Yeah, the Carson Wentz is he is an up upgrade. Where was Pittman at last year? Eight? Did he get up to eight, eight touchdowns? Season? Michael Pittman? Michael Pittman? Yeah. What was check on that for me? Michael Pittman scored. We have uh, six just, touchdowns. Oh, six. Great. Six touchdowns. Yes. Yeah, that's I'm, that's I'm not unbelievably optimistic for Terry's touchdown totals, but like it, it, again, we, we went through the whole Terry's thing touchdown with, totals. Yeah. We went yeah. the whole thing with DJ Moore. Like, there's at least some hope here for Terry McLaurin that he can maybe hit six plus receiving touchdowns where oh, so right now Terry McLaurin is Jason's the most bullish he has him at 18 Mike at 23 Mike trying to fit in perfectly with where he always finishes 28 21 25 hey man <laughs> just and I went on it like I see it I was the lowest I'm probably too low I have him at 31 we all have him way under ADP though well kind of um, we have him under sleeper redraft ADP, but what's there? There is some curiosity this time of year. There's a lot more drafts going on in, sure. in best ball than than our home leagues. That'll ramp up here soon. And he is one of the biggest cases to me of seeing what the money is doing on Antonio Gibson versus what the Terry McLaurin. Uh, oh no, were I, you building an Antonio Gibson? Case I was. I was building an Antonio Gibson. We're talking about Terry McLaurin. Yeah, wasn't listening. Okay, you stand by. Uh, yeah, we'll I got. I got some moment. great stuff here. <laughs> Come back to me in just a moment. It's really interesting. But do you have any no, Terry McLaurin? No, oh gosh, no, none. I mean, I, now who is Terry McLaurin? Um, you got to remind me about. No, no. Sorry, I was I was researching something, and, and that's I, why Antonio Gibson is a great pick. Oh, that's good. Um, yeah. So why don't you guys do do me a favor? Talk about Terry McLaurin for a minute. Um, I was hoping. I thought he was just miss. I thought he was just miss. <laughs> <laughs> I thought he was just misspeaking the name. But no, no, he had no. a full case for a different player. Uh, oh, outstanding! Welcome back to the whole uh, the whole team being together. This woo. is a delight. I know who to go to with Antonio Gibson oh, yeah, yeah, related yeah. analysis just, momentarily. Just wait for it. It's a secret. Uh, okay. But McLaurin, look, there, it's it's similar to the Baker thing. You should have. <laughs> more catchable targets than you did last year. But this is still a situation, and I think it, it exists in Carolina, where both teams don't necessarily project to be uh, playoff contenders. And those situations can get really muddy over the back half of a year at the quarterback position with the offense. Um, so, I, you know, is Carson Wentz an upgrade? Probably. Is he somebody that's going to guarantee Terry McLaurin a top 15 finish? Unfortunately not. And it's like, it's looking at the market. Okay. So I'll, I'll throw out some names for you guys and you tell me who you want. You want Terry McLaurin or Michael Pittman? Pittman. Yep. Terry McLaurin or either of the Broncos wide receivers? I uh, definitely the Broncos. Yeah. I think the Broncos. That's close to me. Terry McLaurin. Let's see. Let's get a good one. Uh, Terry McLaurin or DK Metcalf or DK Metcalf. Terry McLaurin. Yeah, I'll take DK to figure it really? out. Really? They're oh, right yeah. on sleeper. They're right next to each other. But all the other guys I listed are like around. I, I his after. name popped into my head because he was another player. I go, ooh, what, yeah, do ex what yeah. am I going to expect here? Just betting on the talent. But you, you know, could Jahan Dotson come in and actually provide a benefit to McLaurin and be relevant it's himself possible. because you have somebody. And Curtis Samuel, like, I don't even see his name in our doc. Yeah, he's... <laughs> but he is very much going to be a On functional part of the offense, if not a fantasy contributor, a player that makes you go, dang it, McLaurin didn't catch that touchdown because Samuel did. Yeah, he has the talent to do that. He's being paid to do that. Um, the one thing that we saw, and this could be a situation of last year, the options that he really had to throw the ball to, but I don't, I don't want to overinflate rookie Jahan Dotson uh, or or my man from last year Curtis Samuel to a level that is much past you know a Zach Pascal last year uh, as the wide receiver two that Carson Wentz was throwing the ball to and you had Michael Pittman Jr. with a 25.7 percent market share so I think that you know and he was the wide receiver 15 
I do think that Carson Wentz can support Terry McLaurin to be a top 15 wide receiver. Um, but it is, it is tough. And, and Andy, you brought this up earlier. I've brought this up a couple times. I have my, my thing to remember going away from last year was that mediocre quarterbacks coming in to save the day, never save the day. Let's talk about this, uh, player, Antonio Gibson, Oh, oh baby running back for the Washington Manders <laughs> studied for the wrong test. <laughs> <laughs> That's exactly what Chemistry. it was. <laughs> a, a squared plus B squared <laughs> equals C squared. Oh, I thought this was spelling. <laughs> All right, well, hit us. Um, well, hold on. Yeah, what you got, was the you got to lead. What premise <laughs> yeah, led yeah, to yeah. the conclusion? No, read his, what did you think we were so saying we, we about were, him? ADP. We were talking about Shh, read his ADP. Oh. running back 19. Like the round. <laughs> 403. Oh, 403. So let's check this out, guys. <laughs> so oh, man. This is hot one tonight. Yeah, this is one of those things where the money that was <laughs> that is going on in, in, in real drafts on underdog right now versus the kind of stagnant home leagues that aren't really drafting right now, you've got a lot of carryover and, and, and ADPs that are from last year or from older takes right now before our home leagues really rev up. But in the money leagues, you've got Antonio Gibson right now being drafted 72.9 in ADP that is going in the seventh round people are passing him by like crazy he is one of the last like potential starters and this is a running back who the last two years has been a top 12 fantasy option 310 opportunities last year I mean he is a really talented athlete he has been good for fantasy and people are scared uh, I don't know if this is entirely because of the Brian Robinson Jr. draft pick in the third round, bringing in another guy to six fumbles. Who, right, the six fumbles is is Antonio Gibson. Robinson is known for not fumbling. Uh, that changed a lot of games for the the uh, football team last year. So it's, Rivera has also said three person timeshare. Yeah, so like it's no the no longer is the the talk of Antonio Gibson being. They're Christian McCaffrey. Those days are done. Yeah, that that at least what they're saying verbally. Now, for me, I I agree that 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 ceiling and hope for Antonio Gibson. I don't think it is available this year in this current form of the team. But that's to me that's more just because of J.D. McKissick. Like McKissick siphons off a bunch of targets. Gibson was. Just give me a kiss. Thank you, <laughs> Gibson. Yeah, he got me good with that one. Did you raise the volume on uh, that? Last year, like Gibson, when McKissick went out with injury, Gibson was seeing you know over four targets a game. When McKissick's healthy, that's down in the you know just over the two range, which is that's not what you want for someone who is a converted wide receiver. But it is what it is for Brian Robinson. I, I'm not the, the draft pick of Brian Robinson doesn't just terrify me for Antonio Gibson. They needed somebody else in the backfield just in case. They, I mean, Jarrett Patterson was an undrafted free agent that they brought on, and he made the roster because they, they had no other options at the running back position. So I, I think this, the the pick of Robinson was more of a Rivera saying, "I need to have a high T running back room." Not that it means that Antonio Gibson is completely toast for fantasy football. The one thing I think worth discussing is when McKissick played. He was on pace for 82 targets. Yes. In those same games, Gibson was on pace for 39 targets on the year. Yuck. Once McKissick left in week 12 or 13 to injury, that's when you saw a huge escalation for or a significant one yeah, yeah. for Antonio Gibson. Yes. So um, if you don't get targets and you do see a workload reduction – you just need to come to a place of acceptance that Gibson represents something completely different to your offense. Mike, would you are you Gibson or Rashad Penny? Ooh, that's an interesting question. Uh, at at this point, I'd still go with Gibson. I, I think it'll be a better offense than you know the Geno Smith or Drew Locke situation or, in Seattle, or the most recent rumor, the Jimmy Garoppolo. Oh yes, Seattle yes. Sea Chickens. That is that's floating around there. Uh, Logan Thomas, should we be paying any attention to him right now? I mean, week three, ACL, MCL, meniscus injury. I'd, it's hard to see a world where he's back this year. The Giants 
play football. Four wins, 13 losses last year. Had a preseason win total of seven, so underwhelming. Um, According to Warren Sharp, the Giants, only team in the NFL to not have one week sitting above 500 at any point over the last five seasons. That's that's interesting, and they have they have completely cleared house. So it's you can't. I mean, it's, you have the personnel of yes, Daniel Jones is the quarterback, but thirteenth in pace of play, but thirty first in points per game, thirty first in passing yards, twenty fourth in rushing attempts. All these horrifically bad numbers. You can't f- just go off of those moving into this year because. But I had such hopes for Jason Garrett. Yeah, well, he, he's <laughs> he's gone. Joe Judge is gone. Hey, does anyone have a job application? It's me, Dave. He's oh. been removed. Like everybody's gone from the Giants, and but gone and good. Uh, no, no, and and I totally get that. But here is where the New York Giants are interesting. Saquon Barkley can still be a three-down running back, and he is being drafted at the back of the second round. He and he is the only Giants going anywhere near like that actually registers on ADP. Meanwhile, these wide receivers are all going in the double digit round and the giants are going to be better than they were last year. Did you say the double digit round? That's yeah, what got me. So. Oh, uh, Saquon in look, I was going to make the argument that he has a very similar situation to Zeke. Except for Zeke's going behind him and I'd rather have Zeke with the number one offense in the league versus sure. Saquon where you may have a whole bunch of between the 20s he looks okay and then you never score so I guess that's where when you told me it was the back of the second round for Saquon my first thought was well Zeke is a better value he could be but what I mean what if you're you can start with your pick of the wide receivers in the first and, no I, and then come back with Saquon and Zeke like I, I high risk. I get it, but if that's interesting, no oh, that that would be a great start. I mean, Zeke or uh, Sa- Saquon is someone that over the last couple of years we've kind of uh, not been. Let me into, tell you about Antonio we, Gibson. We have not been into. Yeah, wait, <laughs> wait, 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 you're talking about Saquon? Um, no, he, he's someone we haven't really been into, and I find myself rising on him drastically. You know, he is still only 25 years old. That is very young. We were just talking about Michael Gallup and how. The evidence is that your first year back from an ACL, you are simply not as good. You don't get back to peak performance until the year two. We've we've seen that a lot of times. And so this is year two for Saquon at 25 years old from that injury. He also had an, an ankle injury. He, he kind of had a, a, a – It was a very fluky ankle injury where yes. he just – he backpedaled. If, if you don't remember, he backpedals, ends up stepping on someone else's foot. I mean, it, it's a, a basketball injury and rolls his ankle and then, then it just poof, swells up like an orange and then he misses a month. I, I think he's going to be fully healthy. And the depth chart here is as great slash horrific, depending on your perspective, as it could get. It's Saquon Barkley and nothing else. So you're going to get volume. The- you're going to have talent. But I, I do think... Give me the names around Saquon. Uh, oh, uh, yeah, I'll let you finish your thought. I just wanted somebody. To I'll grab it. Look, look up some names around him because I don't have any problem with him as an independent situation. But I want to see what names are. Yeah, while him. you look that up, I, I, I do think he's going to be talented and assured of work. Uh, the problem here is we still are hoping that he gets back to rookie year and first part of sophomore year Zeke, where he had Eli Manning throwing him the ball 115 times. That's really, I don't believe, ever going to be the case again where I, I don't see him as that, you know, top five insta-slam awesome guy, but I do think that he is someone I'm willing to draft now as he drops to the back of the second. All right, so if you're looking at a wide receiver, ADP-wise, that would be... No, give me give me the running backs in his range. Okay, the running backs in because his... Because if I make that decision to go wide receiver early and you were saying, okay, you can come back later and get Zeke as one of your foundational running backs, would I actually do it? All right, so... Uh, on let's go look on. Uh, I've got, I've got some here. If what you, do you got? So, uh, Javante Williams or Saquon Barkley? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean that's tough. That's really tough. Because I'm I'm working from the premise that I've got myself a nice wideout. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And who do I want to lead? I'll probably I'll go Saquon. 
in that situation. In that where situation, you, sure. yeah, where it's not my second choice. Aaron yeah. Jones. Yeah, I'll take Aaron Jones. I would as well. Mike? I, I would take Jones over Barkley, and I think i take Javante. See, if you told me I'd Barkley. taken a running back early and I'm coming back with Javante, I'd probably take him over Saquon in that situation. Right, you're playing for the upside right. versus volume. How about Leonard Fournette, a volume Fournette. play? I would as well. So it, it is tough to to get Saquon. The, the good news is that means Saquon probably isn't going to rise too much in your drafts, and you could still be confident in taking a wide what, receiver early. What division? Not that I didn't listen or anything, but what division did you guys discuss? NFC South. Oh, so you talked Tampa. Yes. Interesting. So I don't have to sit here and talk about Leonard Fournette on a divisional you, breakdown show and how depressing it is that he's going to be so good again. Yeah, is that what you to. said? What did you say on the show? Uh, good dude do you you'll remember have, you'll have to go check the tape yeah. on that one no uh, i record Fortnite. and then just the ram is emptied once <laughs> once i leave this booth i guess we should talk about their wide receiver yes. room because yes, of because course 42.4 million dollars is devoted to it which is the most in the nfl so it has to be very influential of fantasy right everybody loves these guys and which one do you draft? Kadarius Tony. Yeah. I am. He's super interesting because nobody wants him. I, I, I The off season, it seemed like they were even trying to get rid of him. He's yeah. had weird off the field issues. But he that, had, you're like a, it's like a bad boyfriend. Like you want the, you want the uh, tough guy? No, it's just, no. My you want the bad boy? My point is. Nobody wants him. So you want him? In the, in the off season, things looked bleak. And so I, I, I it's depressed his value. When we saw him on the field, he was absolutely electric. His targets per route run, which is one of the sticky stats of t that are very, very telling for guys that are earning targets, was outstanding. He was a rookie. He's coming into year two. They've got Brian yeah, Dayball they, here. They just literally drafted another one yeah, of him Wondell because Robinson. they – and no, I get, I, you know who's a even more depreciated value? Oh, yeah. Maybe I can interest you in a little bit of <laughs> – <laughs> oh, Kenny G. I mean, there was a time, there was a time very recently where we were talking about Kenny Galladay as one of the premier wideout talents in all of football. Last year came and went, and the year before was injury plagued. Yeah, no, but I, he's two rounds below Kadarius Tony. That's that's fine. I do not care. I'm going to go with the you. If I'm going on garbage offense, I want youth and I want. The, the upside of that, of, of an elite type of, of Twitch athlete like Kadarius Toney. Yeah, Wandale Robinson was added to the roster, but he's he's a rookie. Is w Will Wandale be able to do the things that Kadarius Toney did, which is as a rookie in his fifth game in the NFL, caught 10 passes for 189 yards while not even finishing the game because he got, you don't got have removed. To, you don't have to talk me into – you know, tell those were elite, unique, special wide receiver skills. Yes, but over the back half of the year, it was leg, ankle, yeah. oh, yes, shoulder, quad, oblique, COVID. I mean, it was a it was a laundry list yes. of every body part that you got. His body did not want to play in the NFL, but I, I believe he also had a game with um, a shoe problem. He showed up with the wrong shoes. Did he? Yeah, I did not remember this. Might this. Be, I, I'm trying to that search. That was Cinderella. <laughs> right. It didn't fit. It was weird. It was made of glass. They're like, you can't play a glass. So you yeah, it'd be, it'd be dangerous. Yeah. Dang it. Why do you keep going? <laughs> so, but there there was something. Kyle, vet that for me. There was something where he. The Cinderella, what, the Cinderella shoe? <laughs> yes. Yeah, no. I, I promise. Glass cleats. Vet that cleats. story. <laughs> glass cleats not allowed. Um. No, I mean, I don't look, whatever. It's the 10th round. It's the 11th round. I don't care if you take your shot there, but I will say this one good week. If he starts the year with a Sammy Watkins, he may end it with a Sammy Watkins. That's all I'm saying. They, they are just, I like Brian Dable. I like what he'll be able to bring from a ingenuity standpoint to this offense, but everything else connected to him. Do you think that that Kafka can have a metamorphosis for this team? Yeah, I mean, I think that they're going to do the best with what they have. That's that's a literature joke, just for everybody out there. Yeah, read some books lately. <laughs> <laughs> just dunk. I mean, that's just so so rude. Unnecessary dunk. <laughs> oh. Read some books lately. <laughs> <laughs> and no, actually, I'm not. That was just pulling from the English lit. Yeah. Um, 
Um, a, a name I will throw out there because I've seen some drafts recently where I'm surprised this player still gets drafted. Um, Sterling Shepard is mm, no, 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 yeah, no, 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 no. Yeah, yeah. I'd rather you might not. just be thinking, oh, this is an ambiguous uh, wide receiver That's situation. Why you draft it's Tony. A, yeah, you right. You 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 want someone out of this because someone could break it out when you're talking the ten t uh, the, the rounds ten and plus. But Shepard's injury, he's not draftable. Who wins the division? I'm gonna go I'm Eagles. Very, I'm very comfortable saying Dallas. Yeah, I will. Oh man, I'll take Dallas. Toughest player to it's hard. that's close. Toughest player to project in the division for you is AJ Brown. Uh, to me, it's Gibson. Gibson for me as well. Yeah, sneakiest player for uh 2022 or a sneaky dynasty ad from this group. I would say w w Wandale is interesting to me for a redraft or a dynasty. I think I think both are interesting with where his draft capital was, and it could be one of those things where we're talking Tony Galladay all off season, then we go, oh, yeah. Yeah, for me, it's it's the year two wide receivers that I think are just are, are values. Uh, Devonta Smith, and Kadarius Tony, those those two guys that I'm targeting late in drafts. All right, that's gonna do it. Anything else on Gibson? You want <laughs> any other <laughs> research you got for us? Or yeah, I'll I'll share it with you guys after the show though. It's okay. too good. It's some secret stuff. That'll do it for the Fantasy Footballers Podcast. We'll be back with another episode on Thursday. Thank you for tuning in. You can support the show at jointhefoot.com. Goodbye. Thank you for listening to another episode of the Fantasy Footballers Podcast. Join our fantasy football community on jointhefoot.com and follow us on Twitter at the FFBallers.